Okay, welcome to our first lecture for English 120 this, uh, this semester. And uh, as you know, I'm Dr. Austin, I'm your teacher. Uh, but I actually have some better teachers here with me today. <laughs> some of our faculty members here at the University of Evansville. And I'm gonna be, uh, be bringing people in every once in a while because I'm kind of dull and um, listening to me for an hour for every lecture uh, you know, you'll, you'll get fed up with that. So I'm bringing in uh, people who are smarter and better looking than I am to, uh, to complement the lectures. And uh, today I want to have a roundtable discussion with three of our literature faculty from three different departments. So we have, starting on my left, Diane Brewer from the Department of Theater. And then we have uh, Katie Darby Mullins from the Department of Creative Writing and Mark Chirino from the Department of English. And starting with Mark, you wanted to say a little bit about what you study? Sure. Um, my specialty in the Department of Literature is American literature. So I run the entire gamut from the very beginnings of American literature to uh, about World War II, and sometimes even going more contemporary than that, specializing in the American novel and the works of Ernest Hemingway. I mean, we'll be hearing from Hemingway. We have some hills like white elephants on the oh, syllabus okay. that we'll be hearing from. Right. And Katie, who you'll be hearing from again uh, when we talk about poetry. Yeah, I am. I basically write a little bit of everything. I write fiction. I have written novels. I'm currently dabbling in YA, which winds up has its own problems. Um, but I'm also I'm working on a poetry project right now where I'm trying to learn how to blend sort of the high art of poetry and uh, lyrical precision with uh, pop culture. So it's a book about me and Dr. Phil hanging out. Um, it's called Fun with Phil and Katie. And so far it's been fun for me. I don't know if Phil likes it. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, for me, I'm, I'm interested predominantly in poetry from about 1920 onward. I like World War II poetry, but I also like sort of what happens with the postmodernists, and I like the new formalist movement as well. And in terms of literature, I'm just kind of all over the place. And then Diane is a then, dramaturg. That's right. Tell us what a dramaturg is. Uh, well, that's hard to do, <laughs> <laughs> but I can try. Um, we're always talking about how we want a one sentence definition of what it is that we do. Um, uh, and there really isn't one. Uh, but the way that I define it uh, for myself is that I'm the kind of dramaturg who's obsessed with connections between things. Uh, so those connections can be a part, I can think about, oh, okay, if I'm looking at a play, what's the connection between the beginning of the play and the end of the play? Uh, what's the connection between the characters within a play? What's the connection between this play and other plays that the same playwright has written? What's the connection between the play um, or the characters and the time period that they're living in or the time period that the playwright was writing in? What's the connection between what the director is saying about the play and what the play is saying? What's the connection between what the director says and what the designers are saying? What's the connection between um, this play and our audience. Well, let me just interrupt for a minute. <laughs> Pay very careful attention because this could be on the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> so, you want to give me? Do you want me to give me the, the shorter answer? There is a quiz <laughs> at the every at the yeah yeah. You might have to say that verbatim on the quiz. <laughs> so, I, I, can I give him a shorter answer? Yeah, let's do a shorter okay. answer. Okay, so so I got this answer from an intro to theater student okay. who because I asked them, I gave a lecture on dramaturgy and I said. I need a one sentence answer to the question about you know, what is a dramaturg? And I got the best answer, which is dramaturg is a badass. Okay. <laughs> I love that. There we go. And now it's on my door. <laughs> that is awesome. Okay. So, as you can see, we have a course that is divided into three parts of poetry, drama, and fiction. And we've got that represented here uh, in our first lecture. We've got uh, people who have, have dedicated their lives and their careers to fiction, poetry, and drama. And, uh, and I want to start 
And we'll probably even end with a question because it's a really interesting question. And I bet all of you are asking this question or some version of it, which is, here we are in an economy that's very, very focused on science and technology and engineering and business and healthcare and making widgets and, and <laughs> making money and making stuff. And what possible value is there in studying literature? Uh, and I also was an English professor. My specialty was 18th century British literature. What possible value is there in studying this when there are so many things that have so much more value for making a lot of money. Why, why, how do you even justify talking about literature? Mark, you want to give that a try? Well, I want to first uh, refute your pre the premise of your no, question. Okay. <laughs> refute away. Which is that there are so many things of greater value. Okay. Um, I, think there, I think there are so many things that are more apparent value. And the way to answer your question, which is fascinating, it's a question that really every student should be asking at the University of Evansville is, what is the use of literature in his or her life? Well, from my perspective, there are really two answers, uh, both of which are necessary to, to that question. Uh, one is the practical answer to that question, and the other is a little bit less practical. Um, but just to focus on the pra what is practical about the study of literature, I would really invite uh, any student or any person to go to a uh, any business where he or she sees himself or herself in the future and ask somebody who's successful in that business whether it would be useful to be able to read and analyze difficult texts, whether it would be useful to know abstract ideas, to write well, read well, speak well, and to think critically. And my sense is that in 98% of all occupations, these are skills that are essential to getting ahead in every profession. So that really, the study of literature, the proper study of literature, opens yourself up to absolutely doing anything in the world. Any job in the world can be enhanced with the study of literature. So that is my answer just to the practical element of it. And I'll stop there for now. Okay, Katie, you, you write poetry. I do. Why do you write poetry? Well, What's actually, it it's funny. Um, I actually have the complete opposite answer, <laughs> and not not because I disagree with you. I actually completely agree with you. However, as a writer of poetry, I find myself questioning my purpose pretty much every time I start to do it. Um, poetry isn't particularly widely read, especially contemporary poetry. Unless there you are, have to put music to it. Well, yeah, uh, and, and we, we, I think we're going to talk about yeah. that later in the semester. We, I, we've already filmed that one, so I swear we're, I, we're, that's foreshadowing. We'll talk about <laughs> it. I, I, I used to teach a class on rock and roll and literature and how to write about it. And I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sold on the idea of debating the lyrical content of poetry and things like that. All of that being said, um, every time I sit down to write, I go, what am I doing here? Um, and recently, and I'm, I'm actually going to go to a Facebook war that happened on a colleague of mine's page, and it was nasty. We had a friend who was just saying these horrible things, and it was ending with, your life is pointless. Poets are worthless. You are, you are spending your life doing something nobody cares about and nobody will ever read. And my husband, who is a patient care tech on an oncology floor and not a poet, um, and sometimes makes fun of me for being a poet, jumped in and said that he thought poetry was at least as important now as it was back when Solomon and Job were writing it, and that we need poetry to be able to express um, our emotions in these even more challenging times because we're, we have got this new 24-hour news cycle going at us. He probably said some other things too. I'm not advising you to look this particular thread up, but that I um, it, it made me really um, remember that a lot of the books that moved me when I was younger, including the Book of Job, which again we'll talk about more, um, I think kind of were the things that nurtured me. And I think that when I think about poetry, I think about nurturing, and it's something I go back to again and again. Um, I've had poems that friends have sent to me that whether they wrote them or not, I consider them a gift. Um, and 
phones that I, I have to have somewhere near me just in case I need to get to it because there are things I I get from it that I can't get from anything else. And memorizing poetry is actually proven to be a way to uh, slow your heartbeat down. It's a way of meditation. So the reason I write poetry, I guess, is pretty selfish. Um, it, it makes me happy. And I, I hope that my poetry does something for someone else one day. But even if it doesn't, I think the discussion of other people's poetry, which is largely what goes on in the creative writing class, is very valuable. And I don't think there's any wrong way to talk about poetry. You know, just as a, to, to contextualize it, if I were to ask a hundred uh, very well-educated people what the ten most important books ever written were, uh, I'm guessing at least half of them would be poetry. The Iliad, the Odyssey, the Aeneid, the Quran, much of the Old Testament, uh, the nature of things. These are, these are works of poetry, and they were extraordinarily influential, which is something deep inside of us responds to poetry. Well, it's a distilled form of literature in that um, you, you have to focus on an image or two max. And those images have to evoke something in the reader that is also at least somewhat surprising in the writer, right? There, there has to be some surprise in what those images evoke. And I, I find that to be, I, again, we've talked briefly about this, but I think it's, it's very important to acknowledge that poetry is surprising and it's jarring and it's something that... If it's working, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. and bad poetry can at least be amusing, right? So <laughs> yeah. it's all got value. <laughs> well, it can at least be an air supply song. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all out of love. <laughs> um, Diane, drama. Yeah. You know, I um, one thing that I, you know, I always really focus on and, and talk about is that really the, the invention of democracy as a political system and the invention of drama happened at the same time in the same place. No. Okay, unless you're in my theater history class. Oh, you don't think that's true? <laughs> no. Tell me how. Uh, oh, that's a really, that's a <laughs> talk about it. Okay. Let's talk about it. Okay. Um, All right. If you are <laughs> thinking about drama as literature, yeah. then it is possible to look back to the, the literary production of the ancient Greeks and mm -hmm. say we're seeing a simultaneous simultaneous developments in democracy mm -hmm. and uh, dramatic literature. Okay. The problem is that the history of theater goes back much, much farther before the documentation. And so one of, no, one of the, I mean, one of the questions that we, that we are always thinking about in theater is um, what is the relationship between ritual and theater? What's the relationship uh, between oral storytelling and theater mm -hmm. and one of the things that we talk about a lot is that it doesn't make a lot of sense to say that theater came from these things okay. um, so there are different ways of there are different ways of saying well maybe theater as we think about it today shares some of the Functions or or aspects of ritual and storytelling, but it's actually its own thing. Its own thing. Its own thing. Why is it such an important? Why is okay, it? Why is it such a <laughs> such an important thing that we see, and all with all of these storytelling and poetry and theater, we see them everywhere. We see them in cultures that had no obvious connection to each other, we see them in societies, we see cultures dev uh, devoting resources to poetry and to theater and to storytelling um, when they had virtually no resources at all. Why, why this in human history, and, and you know, maybe you out there in English 120 land don't devote a lot of resources 
to books of poetry, but I bet you devote resources to, to music that is poetry, and to movies that are theatrical, and to forms of storytelling uh, that, uh, that don't seem to have any obvious economic value, yet for, for as long as we've had a history, we've had people uh, devoting enormous resources to these. Why? Why do people do that? Um, oh, there's so many reasons. Let's just go with one. <laughs> um, or six. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, okay, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Good job. Because, because um, the question of, about why do I study theater is actually the question that my now husband asked me on our first date. <laughs> I got the, the why are you a poet question. Yeah, yeah. The, the, why would you study theater when so many people in the world are starving? Right. And and um, and my answer then is kind of the same as it is now, which is that I don't really want to live in a world that doesn't have theater. And 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 the deeper reason behind that is that. For me, whether we're talking about ritual or theater or storytelling, it's it's about finding ways to connect to something bigger than who we are as individuals, uh, and that the that the experience of the literature or the experience of the theater is a way of sometimes containing um, the circumstances of our lives that, that helping us helping us find a place to frame the circumstances of our lives. Do you think, sense. Do you think I, I wanted to jump in here too and the reason I want to jump in is because I was asked that same question mm -hmm. and my answer is the same too. Um, I said poetry is about being a witness and then allowing other people to be a witness. And, and for me, it's it's all about um, allowing for witnessing humanity, which we can't always do. That's that's got to be literature too, yeah. right? Well, I mean, if you if you watch the Ken Burns documentary of Vietnam, mm -hmm. I just made my way through the whole thing. And this is a perfect example because the music of that era is sort of synonymous with the Vietnam experience. Yeah, you can't, you can't. So out. like, Jimi Hendrix's electric guitar, Bob Dylan's lyrics. And you mean Nobel Prize laureate Bob Dylan's lyrics. <laughs> we talked about that one too. <laughs> right. And yeah. Bob Dylan told Ken Burns, he said, you can use all my music, just don't do blowing in the wind. Come on, right. everybody's had enough of blowing in the wind. But, but no, no, and, and so you see the images of Vietnam, the music is along with it, so the art, of a society is the conscience of it, and it's very it's essential, very important. But Absolutely. but I think it's but but I think it's also even more than that, <laughs> and and you know maybe this is something that you're going to want to throw away. Who knows? Right? But but I remember when I read Orphan Master's Son. Have you guys read that? It took me oh. a long time to get through that. Oh wow, what that a, is not a one sitter. <laughs> no, no, it is a it is a it is not an easy book to read. But but the but one of the most profound things about that about that story is that especially because because the the author comes at it from many different perspectives, but what comes through so clearly is the importance of connecting to one individual in the story, right? That, that, that if you look at North Korea, which is where this takes place, that, that that government understands the power of storytelling that focuses on a single individual. And when you when you can manipulate a story, when you can manipulate the narrative to focus on a single individual, you have an extraordinary amount of political power. 
and it's really hard for me to not think about that today as we as as like as there is a national dialogue that's going on that is focused entirely on a storyteller who consistently puts himself at the center of the story. It gets like can you can you gloss the lower from after sound a little bit just for our audience? Just <sighs> It's been a little while since I've read it, and it's not a, it's not a, um... It's not on the facilities, don't worry. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not an easy narrative, but basically, basically the story, if you don't, huh, how do you describe it? So, <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, you, you're, it opens North Korea up, but in some ways it really doesn't. Yeah, it, it keeps you. So, it so keeps you, you on the outside, but you're yeah. inside the walls. So, so, so you, so you're like you're following a character who gets who gets thrown into a prison camp. Um, but then all of a sudden, you're following a different character, but you don't know if he's a different character or. But he does. It doesn't matter because individuality yeah. is so centered on the yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. So it's, yeah. it's about individuality it's, as a, a way of, like, really just overwhelming a political system right. and, and kind of rolling over people. Right. And, and, and everybody else, everybody except for the focus of the story is only in service to, yeah. that, to that story. And then, and then there's a whole breaking out of it, and yeah. But but it's it's, it's, it's brutal. Yeah, that's I, I think <laughs> we did a good job. We summarized it. Good job. Good. Well, let me let me kind of <laughs> build from that and just talk about one of the things that I value the most in literature, and and this is true of all all forms of literature, probably especially novels for me, is um, I haven't been a lot of places in my life, but I've read about a lot of places in my life. We are reading in this course, we're going to read uh, Things Fall Apart, which is going to give you a window into uh, Nigeria at the beginning of the colonial enterprise. Uh, you know, I, uh, I have made it a point, pardon me? It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But I, I make it a point to try to read about a lot of places. Is literature good for that, Mark, do you think? That's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. all art, but yeah. certainly literature is where you can um, experience things. I mean, anything from science fiction to historical novels to history to, uh, to novels of various ethnicities and um, uh, inclinations. So uh, that's the way to experience a foreign culture is through its art. Without a doubt. So, what are some uh, some novels that you found particularly useful in that regard? Well. I'm going to have to admit to being a little bit um, jingoistic about my novel reading because as a person who teaches American novels, uh, I want to read them all. And so I, I'm really filling gaps of American novels that I've never read. But even that uh, will teach me about eras. We just read Pope Leslie by Catherine Maria Sedgwick in, in, in class. So it's a novel of the 1820s, but it's talking about the way things were way back, uh, how people in 1820 viewed early American history. So that's something I'm never going to experience um, firsthand. So I have to do it through, through the literature. Let me talk a little bit about. I want to talk a little bit about theater in that regard. You mm -hmm. and I have talked about uh, one of my favorite plays, *Death in the Pink Horse*, uh -huh. and how that takes us into the same Nigeria, though not the same tribe, as, uh, as things fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that reading things like that and really opening yourself up to them makes you a better person in any sense? I hope so. How so? <laughs> I mean, that's the goal, right? Because being that's a better right. person yeah. is the goal. We're trying is to the goal. Do. I mean, this is I'm, a... Oh, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's a... It's a really hard play to read, especially the first act. You know? <laughs> um, uh, so, I think doing something hard in itself makes you a better person. 
it doesn't matter to me what it is. That's why this will not be an easy class, <laughs> boys and girls. So you can be a better person. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but, but well, I don't know. Are you asking what I think specifically we can get from reading that play? Or? Well, let's talk, because reading is something we, we do with the fiction and with the poetry. Mm -hmm. We can read plays, mm -hmm. but really, aren't plays meant to be seen? Yes. So when we see a play like that, like Death in the King's Horse, or another one of my very favorite plays uh, is uh, The Sultan's Dilemma, which is from Egypt. Tupac uh al-Qasim, -huh. you know? Uh-uh. Uh, this is about a, a wonderful comic play from the 19th, 19th century about a sultan who discovers that he's actually a slave and has to be sold. Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> and it gets you into it gets you into a different culture. It gets you into a different, you know. There really were Mamelukes. There was a uh -huh. Mamluk dynasty. There were uh, sultans who came from the slave classes. So this, uh -huh. but what this does is it, it takes an Islamic view of of mercy and justice and law and force, right? And does things with it that kind of strike us as as, as uh, familiar because we've seen these things all in play. But the perspective is completely different when you read it on the Western play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so what I what I found, and and, uh, and I, I hope I'm right here, yeah. is that that I when I watch a play, and, and that, watching a play is probably more immediate than than reading a poem or or reading a novel, because I'm engaging not just with the text but with people often from that picture. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And even if I have to watch it on video, because Nobody was going to perform the Sultan's Dilemma in Evansville, probably. Because I'm trying to talk you into it. <laughs> um, uh, there's a there's a sense where I feel like until I until I can get inside of another culture, I really don't have a, any standing to talk about it, or even to talk about my own culture relating to it. And I've never found a better way than than the literature. Uh, whether it's the drama or the novels or the poetry, of understanding what a culture values the most, and uh, you know, and, and trying to take it on its own terms. When you read the Odyssey, for example, mm -hmm. um, Odysseus is a good man by Greek standards. He's a really awful human being by our <laughs> post enlightenment right. standards. I mean, he's he's uh, he's just a, a you know, he's a murderer, and he's a, a rapist, and he's a, a, he's pretty vile. But until you read the Odyssey and then try to understand why they called him a great man, you don't understand that culture. And then when you understand a culture, even if you disagree, and you don't have to agree with everything you read in here. As a matter of fact, I hope you don't. Um, but but you have a, a sort of a basis for talking about relationships when you do that. That makes sense? Yeah, I mean, for me, for me, it's about, um, I feel like sometimes I learn more about myself than I do about someone yeah. else when I'm, when I'm reading or experiencing a good play, you know, and I, I'm always looking for that profound experience in the theater, and um, one of the most profound experiences that I can remember was when I was watching a play, it was written by a, a Chilean playwright, uh, and I had a moment where I thought, I will never be the same person again. Is this by any chance death in the movie? Yes. Oh my gosh. That is a, that's, yes. Yeah, that's, right? I will that is never. A, that's a hard I will, play to read. I will never be the same person again. And and to have a, it, it was like a snap. And, the, you know, the, not all that different from today in class we were talking about the cherry orchard, you know. So the, in that play there's a string that breaks and it's like a, it, it's, it's not just the separation in, from one moment to another, but but everything that comes along with that, every sound, every emotion, every word, it's like hanging in the air. What this leads to is uh, sort of the second half of my 
long-winded first response, which is why we study literature, which is that I bet everybody at this table, and I hope everybody in this world, had at least one moment where art totally transformed who they were as people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dr. Austin, did you have one when you were 13 or 14? Was it music or a novel or a visual art or a play where you just, you just, when there was a before and an after? Yeah, it was the heart of darkness. Yeah. I was 19. <laughs> And and I when I finished had a the really hard time darkness, reading that. Yeah, that's yeah. a good um, one. And then the second one that did it to me, I was thirty five and I'd read it twenty times before and never really liked it. And all of a sudden, I got it. Was Tolstoy's death of Ivan Ilyich? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And one, once I understood that, I knew I was middle aged. Twenty five. Thirty five. Thirty five. Okay. I was teaching that in a world literature class before I really understood what it meant. You have to be a certain age. I, I hate to take a step backwards, but I actually, you were talking about using theater as a moment to know yourself better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and this is going to sound completely unrelated at first, but um, I um, I acted in Dallas um, before I came up here, and then I acted at a civic theater here for a while. I had always figured I'd go back to acting eventually, but I was going to learn how to write first, and I'd get you know, scripted and learn, learn what to do with it. And uh, and learn and learn more about character and empathy and kind of build towards it. Um, and a couple of months before, no, gosh, it would have been nine months ago now. A girl from one of my Dallas acting troops killed herself. And this this becomes important in a second. I became obsessed with it, and my husband was like, "I don't I don't understand. I don't know why you're having this problem." So I decided to write a poem uh, called Into the Woods. Mm -hmm. And I used the, but I wish, I wish, but I wish, isn't it nice to know a lot and a little bit not as my backbone. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem, as I'm writing this poem, I'm writing as a Cinderella. And then I realize, well, maybe she's more naive than that. Maybe she's little red and then it flashes. Like, you don't know how to even see it. I had a friend go missing and she was like, and to say that they could have been identical twins is an understatement. And I had performed Into the Woods with this friend. And uh, she had been with a red riding hood. I did not remember that until I started writing this poem. Mm. And again, it's, it's silly because in some ways it's got this Dr. Phil element where he's teasing it out, right? That was that Everything was. Everything goes back to Doctor Phil. Well, it does. He's, yeah. he's he's so wise, and I got to tell you, it's it's working in ways it shouldn't because the pop culture element people keep writing back, and they're like, this shouldn't work, but we're gonna take it. Like it's like they're angry at me for making them like Doctor Phil, which makes me very happy. <laughs> let me go on. Let me just ask a question here on because you raise a really good question. Where is the line between high art and low art? Between well, Doctor Phil's not high art. Dylan. Is there a line? I mean, well, don't like tell him I said that. Keith Richards said they asked Keith Richards if his music was art, and he said, "For me, art is just short for Arthur." So, yeah. and there's it. It's what well, you, it's what you make of it. You know, he was on solo. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I would say his guitar solo on the end of "Can't You Hear Me Knocking" is art. I would say the lyrics to "Happy." You know, so Richards is kind of up in the air for me. <laughs> but it's but you know, we all and all of us and all of you consume art at a, a very high rate. Oh, absolutely. Whether it's movies or music or television shows, uh, you're consuming narrative. You're consuming poetry. You're consuming theater. Is is that as valid uh, as Death and the Maiden or For Whom the Bell Tolls? I mean, is, are the Kinds of art that uh, that are part of popular culture is that even a legitimate distinction? Some of them are. I think yeah. some of what's being written today is as evocative, and some of it's more important. Dennis Smith has a book, a chapbook out right now called Black Movie, and it's where he goes back and rewrites all the popular movies of the last hundred years as black movies. Um, one called Dinosaurs in the Hood is particularly good. It ends with him screaming over and over on stage, and they will not kill the black boy, and they will not kill the black boy, and they will not kill the black boy. Um, I'd say that's high art. 
Um, but it absolutely, I mean, he talks about Cecily Strong. I mean, he talks about actors. He talks about uh, Will Smith. He discusses Jurassic Park. He discusses In the Hood. You know, it's, it's all, you have to be familiar in a language of pop culture to understand black movie. He also does The Lion King. And they're, they're brilliant pieces. So I think, I think uh, can you marry pop culture, popular culture, with um, high art? Absolutely, it can be done. I think Faulkner wrote film scripts, right? Right, okay. and they were great. Yeah, Bob Dylan won a Nobel Prize. It and, uh, I, I think that <laughs> this study of literature will also allow you to, when you go to just the blockbuster movie on the weekend, You'll just be asking more interesting questions about it and making sharper observations. And knowing your, your family. Yeah, that, but that's what, that's what it's all about. <laughs> well, and I think well, it helps you understand other things better. I mean, or sometimes I say to my students that the reason we're studying this is so that we get more books. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've said that more than once. <laughs> you know, it's your life will be a lot funnier if you have read the canon because yeah. people yeah, yeah, refer yeah. to this. Yes. Yeah. I, I once, true story, I was teaching Paradise Lost, and a student told me they had not read the Bible and didn't really understand who Adam and Eve were. And I said, you, You've got to read this, or else you're never going to get any jokes in your life. Right. It's, <laughs> not about, right, right, right. it's not even about religion. And I tell my students, yeah. if you haven't read the Bible as literature yet, you are not ready to graduate. Yeah. You know. Okay. Well, any parting comments you want to make? Thank you so much for uh, for taking your time to come and help me teach my class. I feel like Mark Twain and the and the you know painting the fence. That's that's a joke you'll get. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> Mark see, Twain. he's got this. Enjoy the class. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, nice now it's time for your quiz and your bulletin board questions. <laughs>